meeting many of you. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, someone asked me if I was going to be in costume uh, this morning. This is the only costume I have that fit in the suitcase, so... Um, and the beards. The beards of the Reformation era were something else, weren't they? Uh, I wouldn't be able to if I tried, so... Um, I'd like to uh, begin by reading from Scripture this morning, from Psalm 8. If you dig into the Reform Reformation era... Uh, instruction in the seminaries, in the schools that the reformers started, you will find that most often the professors began to lecture from the book of Romans, and a close second was the book of Psalms. As you well know, the statement that Calvin made, uh, the Psalms are an, an anatomy of all parts of the soul, or Luther called it the, the little Bible, uh, comprehending uh, so much of, of uh, biblical doctrine and experience and Christian experience. So I want to turn then to, to the book of Psalms, Psalm 8, and we'll spend some time there uh, later, the second half of the presentation. To the chief musician upon Gittith, a psalm of David, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the, above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. When we think of the Reformation, what are some of the, the names that come to mind as we, as we think of the Reformation? Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, Knox, Melanchthon. Has, ever, has anyone ever heard of a man named Wolfgang Musculus? Vaguely. All right. Who knows what Musculus means? Is there a Latin scholar in the crowd this morning? Or a German scholar? Mauslein. Mauslein. Little mouse, exactly. So musculus is the Latin diminutive form for, for mouse, little mouse. So Wolfgang Little Mouse. That name will stick in your mind now, isn't it? So the title of my presentation is Wolfgang Musculus, A Tiny Mouse and a Massive Commentary. So Calvin and Luther, of course, are some of the most prominent names in the Reformation. And while that's true, the his historical records demonstrate that the Reformation was not just these two men. The Reformation was a vibrant network of, of men who embraced the Reformed doctrines of grace. Of course, as they came to the foreground through men such as Luther and later Calvin, the second generation reformer, but these two men were not alone in spearheading the Reformation throughout Europe. God used various men, variously gifted men. That's what we see in the church today as well, don't we? We see some leaders stand out above uh, some of the pastors and teachers and leaders in the church. But by and large, the church continues to exist because of variously gifted men that God has placed in different areas. That's true of the Reformation as well. So we shouldn't just think of the Reformation in terms of Calvin or Luther or Zwingli or Melanchthon. It's true these men were important, but surrounding them were these other men. One of them is, is Wolfgang Musculus. And so the Lord worked in the time of the Reformation through these men. There's a vibrancy of cooperation in the Reformation from country to country, from city to city, from university to university. It was a vibrant network, and we talk about Facebook and Instagram and how that ties 
uh, so many people together. Well, the 16th century had their own uh, communication networking. These men wrote uh, many, many volumes of letters. If you go back to their works, you'll find that they, they, they wrote many letters to each other. So there was a, a network of letter writing. There were shared educational centers. They would travel from one center to another, teaching and learning and teaching and learning. Uh, we'll see that in uh, Musculus's life as well. There were educational centers, Wittenberg, Geneva, Heidelberg, Leiden, Utrecht, Bern, Cambridge, and Oxford. But of these lesser known reformers, Wolfgang Musculus has not received the, the attention uh, that he deserves. And so in my dissertation, I've begun to address some of that, although there's a lot more that can be done. So let's look for a moment at Musculus's life and ministry. He was born in 1497 in the German village of Deuce. Relatively little is known about his early life. But what we do know is that he entered the monastery at Lixheim, Germany. And as he entered that monastery, he spent much of his time there reading Luther's works. Get this, okay? Roman Catholic monastery, and he's reading Luther's works. He began to, began to defend Luther's works, so much so they began to be known as the Lutheran monk. So here is this Lutheran monk in Lixheim. And he began a voracious reading program of reading the early church fathers. But in 1527, he left the monastery, began life as a clerk to the re reformer Martin Butzer in the city of Strasbourg. And there he learned the original languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, gaining facility in these languages. He took up preaching in the neighboring towns of Strasbourg, kind of a, an itinerant preacher. In 1531, he was called to Augsburg, where he would serve the next 20 years of his life as a pastor and preacher. And as we saw last night, the political forces were very important in shaping uh, these men and shaping the church as well. And so in 1548, the Augsburg interim uh, disrupted life in Augsburg for Wolfgang Musculus. The Augsburg interim was Charles V's attempt. So Charles V was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. This was his attempt to bring uh, some concord between Catholics and Protestants. He imposed the seven sacraments back onto the Protestant clergy. He, um, he wanted to establish peace through this. It was a program of, of compromise and, and consequence. And so it was really uh, forcing the Protestant clergy to adopt some of the Roman Catholic practices while embracing their own theology still. So it was really a, an attempt at compromise. But these men were not willing to compromise. This is exactly why they had left Rome in the first place. And so Musculus was forced to leave uh, Augsburg. And so he fled to Bern, Switzerland. It's not Bern, B-U-R-N, but B-E-R-N. This was not his only option. He was invited to England to teach at Cambridge by Martin Bootser, who had fled to Cambridge. But he declined that invitation and began a professorship in Bern, Switzerland, where he began to write his commentaries. And so in addition to his pastoral work and preaching, Musculus was well known, or became well known, for his publication of various types of literature. The first aspect of that publication was the uh, publication of editions and translations of patristic texts. So he would go back to the patri patristic fathers and he would retrieve them, as it were, for uh, the Reformation, and he began to publish them and to uh, retranslate them into Latin. The second area of his writing is found in the biblical commentaries, and that's where the focus will be in the second part of the presentation. And then thirdly, his loci communes. Loci communes is simply the Latin, which means common places. So what these common places were is, is more of a, a systematic theology, so they'd do their exegetical work in the commentaries, and they would come to a particular place, and he would break out a certain section of his commentary and give it a heading. So in some of his commentaries, a commentary on the Psalms, he'd break out a section of the Psalms and, and title it De Cristo, Concerning Christ. And then he would give a short uh, explanation 
of the doctrine of Christ in that particular psalm. So what, what, the, what this um, systematic theology was then was uh, gleaning the cream of, of the exegetical work and publishing it into uh, sort of a systematic theology. Philip Melanchthon uh, was the first to publish one of these. So we can call it an early systematic theology of the Reformation, dealing with various theological topics. But this demonstrates how important uh, the work of interpreting Scripture was for the Reformers. It brings us to the, the, the watchword of the Reformation, sola scriptura, Scripture alone. His commentary on the Psalms had an enduring influence in the Reformation and beyond. Published in 1551, it's his largest exegetical work. So if you were to pick up this book, it'd be 1,200 folio pages. So folio means uh, that, that was the, the structure of the, of the, the pagination in, in the Reformation period, usually two columns on a page, um, 1,200 pages of Latin text. So hardly readable for, for today's standards, not only because it's so long, but because it's in Latin. It was published in several languages and editions. For my dissertation, I tried to get an English, apparently, one of the scholars that I was looking at footnote in an English edition. I started looking for it and contacted this scholar. And he said, no, that's wrong. There is no English edition. So I had to go back and start from scratch and, and work from the Latin. Um, so uh, there, there, is, there is an English translation of his comments on Psalm 51 in St. Paul's Cathedral in, in London, England but I didn't have the, the means and the time to get over to London, England, but maybe someday, maybe someday I'll get this. And, but I hired some, some translators to help me speed up the work. But, um, so now we have some more English text of the, of the Psalms commentary, and maybe Lord willing, I'll be able to publish that in, in some way in the next several years. But it had an enduring influence, his Psalms commentary. If you read Calvin's preface to his commentary on the Psalms, he writes this about Musculus' commentary. He says, In the judgment of good men, Musculus has earned no small praise by his diligence and industry in this walk. So in referring to his commentary. So Calvin esteemed Musculus for his work in his Psalms commentary. So if Calvin says this, that says something about Musculus' standard of work. Uh, Edward Lee the Puritan in his uh, body of divinity refers to Musculus as one of the best commentators on the Psalms. So this man is relatively unknown to us, but to the men of the Reformation and the Puritan era, he was, he was quite well known and highly regarded as a commentator on the Psalms. And something that we often overlook is the fact that biblical exegesis in the time of the Reformation didn't happen in a vacuum. I always had this caricature growing up that the Reformation was the beginning of history. But that's, that's a completely false caricature. And that was shattered as I uh, went to seminary. So maybe it's, it's due to the Christian schools that I went to and they wanted to instill in us the, the theology and the history of the Reformation and that this is, this is where it began. But that's not true. And so my own, in my own mind, I, I, I had to really uh, shift in my understanding of the Reformation. That this is really uh, not happening in a vacuum, but it's, it's taking everything that's happened before. And though Luther uh, discovered justification by faith alone, and that was earth shattering for him, and, and sparked was the major catalyst for the Reformation, yet everything in, in the Reformation finds its heritage in the medieval period, in the patristic period. And so the Reformation didn't happen in a vacuum. Neither did um, the commenta comment commenting on Scripture, uh, the exegesis. The reality is that the Reformers were operating within the tradition received from their time in the Roman Catholic Church. They were educated at monasteries. We know that of, of Luther. We know that of Musculus now. They were operating and recipients of this heritage of the Roman Catholic Church. They were recipients of the medieval methods of scriptural interpretation. But what you, what you see in the Reformation is a shift, an emphasis, where scripture becomes the authority, becomes prominent in the lives of these men in transforming their spiritual lives and transforming the, the theological task as well. 
And so the shifts that happen in the Reformation are crucial to understanding, to the understanding of the gospel. But those shifts, as we saw last night, happened in, an, in a historical context. There are already undercurrents in the Roman Catholic Church, as we, as we understand it from the medieval period, towards a, a more scriptural understanding of justification by faith. So there, were, there were men like John Huss and um, John Wycliffe who were coming to a biblical understanding of justification by faith. They saw the importance of the scriptures in um, and illuminating the mind and transforming the heart and the mind. These men were called forerunners. And so it's on these men that the reformers um, stood. And so as Luther rediscovered the biblical doctrine of justification from the New Testament and the early church, it created a, a seismic shift in the public understanding of salvation. So Luther began to understand justification, and he wanted the common people to grasp this. And how can the common people grasp this? It's when the scriptures are translated into the language of the people, what the Westminster Confession calls the vulgar language. Not vulgar as in dirty or filthy, but vulgar as in common, the common language. And so you see this, this shift, not just in understanding of justification, but in, in how the Bible becomes the central authority in the life and doctrine of the church and of the individual. And so this is underlying this entire um, commenting on Scripture. Salvation now becomes a real possibility with the rediscovery of the gospel and the Bible in the common language. No longer did they have to rely on the priest to tell them what's going on in Latin. They could read it for themselves. This sparked the entire educational enterprise for the common person. That's why we have schools today. Public education, in some ways, is a remnant of the Reformation, even though it's moved far beyond what the Reformers would want it to be today. But in this, we see the remarkable care of the Lord for his church, the revival of his church in the Reformation. Central to the revival of the church is the scriptures. And so, in the case of biblical interpretation, this shift is also apparent. So it was not an entirely new way of interpreting the scriptures, but there was a recalibration of the way scripture was interpreted. How many of you are familiar with the fourfold method of interpretation, the medieval fourfold method? Who's heard of that? Several of you, okay. I'm just gonna give a brief lesson then of, of the fourfold method. The fourfold sense included four aspects four levels of meaning that the medievals gave to Scripture. So first is lit the literal sense. That's a given for us today. There's the literal sense. There's the allegorical sense of Scripture. There's the anagogical, I'm going to explain these in a moment, anagogical, and then tropological. So literal, allegorical, anagogical, and tropological. The literal sense focused on the grammar and the language of the text. The allegorical focused on the spiritual sense and often became the Christological sense in wildly imaginary ways, uh, often detailing the relationship between Christ and his church. The Song of Solomon comes to mind. Um, of course, many in the Reformed tradition today still take the allegorical approach to interpreting the Song of Solomon. But that's an example of some of the abuses of the allegorical sense. The anagogical, so the, the, the allegorical is, is more or less the spiritual sense. And it wasn't just applied to the Song of Solomon, it was applied to all of Scripture. The anagogical meaning of Scripture focused on the eschatological meaning of the text, focusing on the end times and, and what's coming, looking ahead to, to the end of time. And then the tropological, or what's called the moral sense, focused on the meaning of the text in terms of the the moral imperative, what could be deduced from the text for the reader to act on. Interestingly, this shift to the literal sense began in the 13th century with Thomas Aquinas. He was responsible for taking the church into this direction, not as far as the reformers took it, but that shift already began happening in his own thought and in his own works. 
So he was responsible for refocusing the interpretation of scripture on the literal sense. It's interesting that in the time of the Reformation, both the reformers and the Catholics go back to Aquinas. Both claim them as their man. Um, and you see that even today uh, within the reform community, there's lots of debates um, about different aspects of the being of God. Um, and all those distinctions about the being of God derive from Aquinas and a misunderstanding or a right understanding of what Aquinas was teaching. So in a sense, he's a watershed figure in the, tw in the 13th century, not just for his distinctions, but for taking the church back to the literal sense, the literal interpretation of the scriptures. And so between the 13th and 15th century, the, reform, or the, the medievals were, were working with this and taking it further than Aquinas did. Um, you have men, um, I'm, not, I'm not going to, to bother with their names because I can't put it up on a PowerPoint so you actually can't see it, but um, there were particular men who, who took this and took the literal sense and said the, the Christological sense of uh, interpretation of Scripture is not found necessarily in the allegorical. The Christological is in the literal sense of Scripture. So when we look at the words and the grammar of Scripture, this is where we find Christ. Not in some mystical meaning about Scripture, but in the literal sense of Scripture. That's where we need to find Christ in Scripture. And so the literal sense became equated with the Christological sense, and we'll see that in the case of Wolfgang Musculus. So what you see then in the Reformation is an increased understanding of Scripture focused on the literal sense of the text. So when your pastor stands up and preaches on Sunday morning, he's a recipient of this shift in emphasis on the literal sense, the literal meaning of the text. The reformers were, were reading Aquinas. They picked up on the shift. They shed the allegorical excesses of the patristic and medieval inter interpretations of Scripture. But it didn't mean that the reformers discarded all of these other senses. Rather, they brought them underneath the literal sense. So Scripture's authority is vested in the, in the literal sense of Scripture. And everything else, these other three categories of, of meaning, are taken under the literal sense and, and treated as application rather than as uh, the second, third, fourth level of meaning of Scripture. So there is one essential meaning of Scripture. And out of that flows these other uh, applications, the spiritual sense. What does this text mean spiritually? What implication does that have for, for the person reading the text? What implication does this text have in terms of application for the future life? In terms of application, what does this text say about the shaping of my, my moral life or the pastoral implications of this text? And so you see this shift that the literal sense became the focus and everything else became more applicatory, as it were. So the literal sense was foundational. So within this context that Musculus wrote his commentaries, and his commentary on the Psalms, he focuses on the literal sense and demonstrates where warranted that the literal sense is the Christological sense of the text. So let's take a moment and look at Psalm 8 as a test case of this principle, particularly verses 4 through 6. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. So, Psalm 8 is considered a classic psalm referring to what? about Christ, his humanity, the incarnation, right? We're coming close to Christmas. Here's a psalm that we can sing in anticipation of the celebration of the birth of Christ. I'm not sure how much of you, how much of that you do here in the Free Presbyterian Church, but at least in the Reformed churches, there is the church calendar. So. This very concept, that this psalm refers to the humanity of Christ, the incarnation of Christ, is questioned in modern scholarship. 
but it was a given in the time of the Reformation. In terms of exegetical method, Musculus follows the medieval pattern, not just of not just the fourfold sense of scripture, but in actually how the commentary is laid out. He begins with the argument of the psalm. And you'll find this actually coming back in Puritan commentaries as well. So they lay out the thesis statement of the psalm. And then what follows is his own translation from the Hebrew text according to the division of the psalm. Then there are the basic sections of the medieval commentary that follow. So there's the lectio, which is the readings different readings of, of, of text from, so you, they, they interacted with the Latin Vulgate, they interacted with Jerome's translation of the, of the Bible, they interacted with the Hebrew and the Aramaic and different translations from different schools. And so what they're doing is actually a very good um, and thorough treatment of the actual text of scripture, comparing and contrasting all these different translations, and they, they give their own opinion as to what they believe is, is the best translation, much like some of the more technical commentaries today. So there was this technical aspect of exegesis. But then what followed the lexio, or the readings, was the explanatio, the explanation of what the text was saying. And then finally, there's the observatio, the observations, or the, the applications. So you see in, in Musculus's commentary, you see in the medieval commentary, always this push towards application, the pastoral end of things. How does scripture apply to the lives of the people? And so in the argumentum, in the argument of the psalm, Musculus argues that by this psalm, the prophet celebrates the wonderful philanthropy of God, by which that kind of human in itself, very humbled and miserable, is first typified in Adam, then truly perfected in Christ who is exalted over all. So from the very outset, Musculus sees the pre-fall Adam, he sees the post-fall Adam, and he sees Christ as the fulfillment of Adam, the second Adam. But the argument also shows how Musculus viewed the, the, the genre of the psalm. This was not just a song to be sung, this was prophecy. The prophet sees here this allows Musculus to root the Christological understanding of the psalm in the literal sense. In a song, he's able to see it as a prophecy. So David speaks as a prophet, not only looking back at Adam, but looking ahead to Christ coming in his humanity. So there's this aspect of seeing the psalm as prophecy, but then there's also typology. So Adam here is working as a, as a type of Christ. <clears throat> Musculus looks back to the pre-fall Adam, and then he looks to Christ, who's coming to perfect even the pre-fall Adam. One of the key words that Musculus uses here is the Latin word dignitas, or dignity. It refers there to, to how God created man before the fall. The dignity of Adam before the fall is now attributed to Christ and his humanity, the perfection of that dignity. This is important for the development of anthropology, the study of man, and Christology, the study of Christ. Another important aspect of interpreting the psalm and maintaining the literal sense and the Christological is what we call the analogy of faith. This is enshrined in the Westminster Confession in chapter 1, section 9. Of course, later than uh, what musculus is, is Musculus's period, but this comes back in uh, the Westminster Assembly, what Musculus is doing here. The principle that Scripture interprets Scripture. So the Westminster Confession states, the infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold, but one, here you have the literal sense again, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. So what does Musculus do? He looks throughout Scripture and sees how the rest of Scripture impinges and helps interpret Psalm 8. And what does he find? Hebrews 2, verses 6 through 9, is a direct quotation of Psalm 8, 4 through 6. What does the writer to the Hebrews say? He says, this is Christ in his humanity. This is Christ in the incarnation. 
And so you see here, there's prophecy, there's the analogy of faith, and there's typology. These three things Musculus uses as interpretive devices to come to a Christological understanding of the text, a literal understanding of the text. Another intriguing aspect of the Reformation exegesis was that they were keen to, um, to develop doctrine from the text of Scripture. So it wasn't just that they were looking at the words and all the grammar and all the nuances of the text. They were in this for the theological task. So Scripture formed the bedrock of the work that they were doing. You read Calvin's Institutes. The bedrock of that is scriptural interpretation. That's true of the commentaries as well, as I alluded to earlier, in the common places, the cream of the exegetical work was taken and published in these uh, early systematic theologies. And so in the case of Psalm 8, there are three aspects of theology that I want to point out. There's theology proper, as Musculus considers the philanthropy of God or God's love for humanity. There's Christology, Christ and his humanity. And then there's anthropology, pre-fall and post-fall man. So, as he talks about anthropology, there's something that, that comes to the foreground. As he highlights it from the text, the miserable condition of man. So he goes back to Psalm 8. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. So when the psalmist is considering the created order of God, he, he's contemplating man's place in that creation. He says, what is man that thou art mindful of? And the son of man that thou visitest him. Musculus says here, this is a consideration of the misery of man. He's looking at it through the post-fall glasses, as it were. There's this misery of man, of, of human depravity, that provokes the consideration of, of human vanity, humility, and misery. Musculus argues that a consideration of man's misery stands in sharp contrast to God's philanthropy, so God's love for humanity. There's a great separation between these two, God's philanthropy and man's misery, not of distance but of degree, between an utterly infinite God and miserable humanity. So you see, as he's, as he's giving his commentary, he's giving explanation, he's, he's doing theology, if we can call it that. But then he concludes, in spite of this distance of degree, God the infinite and most excellent, so how excellent is thy name in all the earth, God who is the most excellent takes delight in a wretched human being. This is what Musculus terms God's philanthropy, God's love for humanity, that God has an eye towards us. God who is infinite and excellent. God who is the creator of the universe, God is, who is the creator of man, takes an eye towards this wretched human being that I am. God's philanthropy is seen not only in the fact that God interacts with such miserable wretches after the fall, but it's seen in his continued care for humanity after the fall as well. He feeds and nourishes and sustains every creature. That's what Musculus sees from the consideration of these opening verses of the psalm. But there's more to this care of God than, than mere providence. There's something redemptive about these verses that, that Musculus highlights. This psalm speaks not just of God's care for humanity, but of God's visitation to humanity. God coming in the flesh to visit this sin-sick world. God's philanthropy is also redemptive. Musculus states, The prophet wishes to express this unique and remarkable study of divine love of the dignity and kindness towards humanity. And here he says it is the use for the words to remember and to visit. What is man that thou art mindful, that thou dost remember him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Musculus says, Oh, how we are blessed if we might never forget to be astounded of this dignity of God towards the human race. Because of what is in fact most worthy of all things, God calls philanthropia or philanthropy, that is, love to humanity. Whence also Paul calls the incarnation of Christ, the argument and declaration of the philanthropy of God our Savior, saying, 
and after the kindness and philanthropy of God, our Savior appeared. So this divine visitation in the incarnation of Christ excites astonishment in the hearts of believers. Musculus remarks, let us be astounded whenever we are reminded of the incarnation by the word of God, by which God has visited us thus, so that Christ was named Emmanuel, that is, God with us. And so Musculus sees verse 4 as the divine visitation of God to man in the person of Christ. And so I already alluded to the fact that Musculus makes much of the dignity of man. This is in contrast to man's misery. At creation, God made man a little lower than the angels. Now, Musculus doesn't take this to mean angels. He takes this Hebrew word Elohim, and he says this man was made a little lower than God. Uh, we would probably differ with him on that interpretation, but uh, nonetheless, he... He uses this to show the dignity of humanity before the fall. And I think that's a point that we can take home with us. It's similar to Genesis 1.26 where God says, let us make man in our image. It speaks to the divine dignity that God has, has given to man. Not making us divine, but giving us this dignity above all the other creatures. A little lower than the angels. But this dignity is a divine gift. Musculus remarks, for it is granted man was constituted according to the image of God, yet did not receive the perfection of divinity and dominion. Nor is it understood to be a little distinction between God and Adam. When Adam was receiving this dignity as an earthly lord, he was made infinitely inferior to God. But that dignity is reflected in the fact that God made Adam lord over creation, his vicegerent. While this elevated condition was part of the, the fall, or uh, part of creation before the fall, the fall profoundly altered this dignity for us, according to Musculus. Humanity now lives in a miserable condition. In contrast to God's philanthropy, his love for humanity, humanity is now demonstrating this misanthropy, so a hatred for man. That's what's in our hearts, Musculus argues. So the loss of this dignity and misanthropy lies latent in the heart. He argues it's the, it's the cause for every kind of diabolical evil, faithlessness, atrocities, tyranny, contempt, and neglect of other human beings. So what he's doing here is he's, he's studying humanity. Humanity before the fall, he's saying, here is man before the fall, created with this dignity. But now after the fall, we are haters of our fellow man. Indeed, the fact that humanity lost his dignity through Adam, Adam's sin means that it could not, only be, could, could not be regained, but it is also exacerbated. It's made worse, Musculus says. It's experienced in our disobedience and rebellion. It's part of our daily existence. This is something we are always living with, this, this misanthropy, this, this loss of dignity. And yet man's dominion over creation remains as a glimmer of that dignity that we once enjoyed. This dignity in the Reformed uh, faith later is, is said to be uh, man was created in true righteousness, uh, knowledge, righteousness, and holiness before the fall. We've lost that after the fall. But remnants of that image of God remain. Remnants of this dignity remain. And it's at this point that Musculus reaches to Hebrews 2 and reaches to Christ for the restoration of that human dignity in humanity. He says that that dignity was conferred and then lost by Adam, but is now conferred upon and perfected by Christ, the second Adam. Christ receives this dignity in the incarnation. It has implications for humanity post-fall. So here's the gospel in Psalm 8. Musculus comments, Since this place is being accommodated to Christ by the apostle in Hebrews, we consider what dignity human nature receives in Christ the head. How by his obedience... This dignity will not only have been restored to a certain degree, 
but will be enlarged without measure, namely even at the coming of the kingdom of heaven, which certainly has not been delivered by Adam. So what's happening here? Musculus is teaching union with Christ. He's saying union with Christ is vital for the restoration of this human dignity for us today. If we would be restored to this dignity, if we would have this dignity enlarged in our lives, in its anticipation and glory, we need to be united to Christ by faith. This is the solution to the loss of human dignity. And so believers live with this tension between receiving that dignity in principle and the final fulfillment of that dignity in glory. And so here we have operating these, these three aspects of anthropology, of Christology, and theology. God coming down to visit man, man in his post-fall condition of misery and misanthropy. But then we also have Christology, because in that visitation, Christ comes, assumes humanity, but also perfects that humanity by his own obedience. And this leads to the final aspect of his commentary on Psalm 8. That's the evident desire to promote the piety of the faithful from the text of Scripture. So here we have the application. And I think you'll hear an echo of those other three senses of Scripture that the medievals had, had espoused. Several applications flow from the text of Psalm 8. First, the consideration of man's miserable condition after the fall serves to check our pride and induce in us a spirit of humility. We ought not to think more of ourselves than we are. When we consider who God is and who we are in this infinite degree of distance between us, this brings humility into the heart. And here, Musculus has a word especially for rulers. It's interesting how they also did not hesitate to speak to the, to the politicians, to the rulers of the day. They would be tempted to negate the effects of the fall. And he says that they should not do that. And so this consideration of, of man's misery should also lead to a detestation of the diabolical evil that now resides in humanity and renders us haters of one another. So there is a sense in which those who are believers are called to hate the sins of this world that we see, the sins of this human nature manifested in the world. That's an application for us in the present day as well. It should lead us to a detestation of the diabolical evil that resides in us and in others. It reminds me of uh, Jude 24, uh, rescuing those from the fire, hating even uh, the garments that have been spotted with sin. The consideration of this loss of dignity of man's misery should lead us to humility because of the undeserved character of that honor and glory bestowed upon humanity, even pre-fall. When we consider what God has given to us before the fall, it should induce in us a spirit of humility. And then post-fall, the fact that man lives in such misery and yet God looks upon them with philanthropy and visits them through the incarnation is a cause for admiration and worship. So when we consider our humanity, our miserable condition, it checks our pride, leads to a hatred of diabolical evil in society today, leads us to humility, and it leads us to worship. The second application is this. Humanity, though living in this miserable condition, is not devoid of hope. There is hope for us this morning. Man's hope for restoration lies in the incarnation of Christ. This evidence is God's love for humanity. If it is through Adam's disobedience and transgression of the divine precept of the law by which we have lost our dignity, then it is by Christ's obedience in the incarnation by which this dignity is restored in its fullest sense. 
Musculus reminds believers that it is a great thing to have a Lord in heaven who gives us all things from the Father, including his own dignity, the dignity of his humanity he confers and imputes to us. Musculus doesn't use the word imputation, but here already you have this, this, it's, it's there in seed form if you want to call it that, the imputation of Christ's obedience to restore the dignity of humanity. Because it's by disobedience that we lost it. He reconstitutes man in honor and glory and divine dignity. And he's at work in bringing that to its fullest sense. And so, thirdly, while this dignity is restored by Christ's incarnation, it is not only reserved for Christ... But Musculus reminds believers, let us also judge how far this dignity of Christ pertains to us as his members. This is something that reformers were often fond to make use of, the head members distinction. All things are ours because of Christ, just as the apostle writes in 1 Corinthians 3. So there's this language of head members, of union with Christ. The benefits that are given to those that are now in union with Christ, including a newfound and restored dignity far better than Adam could provide for us, for the human race. So this no longer limits our dignity to dominion over creation, but it elevates redeemed humanity to the position of co-regency with Christ. And here Musculus begins to, to look ahead to when we will be seated with Christ in heavenly places, already now, but at the final judgment, we will be sitting with Christ, judging the world. And so there's this, this co-regency that, that Musculus looks ahead to as part of our humanity in glory. And then fourthly, this enjoyment of this dignity is real. Sometimes we struggle with that because of indwelling sin. We wonder, is this dignity really restored? I'm disobedient. But I need Christ's obedience again. It's experienced, this dignity, amidst three particular tensions for the faithful that Musculus highlights. The first tension involves the observation of the wicked and what they seem to enjoy. Musculus argues that the wicked seem to enjoy more of this dignity than the faithful. It's a Psalm 73 type conundrum, isn't it? Asaph looks at the wicked and he sees them enjoying life. And he's suffering and he's saying, why is that? Until he went into the house of God and he understood the end of the wicked. Musculus is alluding to Psalm 73 and that experience. And he says, it seems incongruous that we are experiencing suffering. The effects of this fallen humanity while the wicked seem to, to walk free. But he reminds us that while it seems the wicked seemingly have more of this dominion and dignity, the faithful will live with this tension until we are led into that possession of all good things by the Father. So he's saying to us, don't look to the wicked. Look ahead. And here we have this, this sense of looking to the future, the anagogical sense. The second tension is the now not yet tension that we are familiar with in Reformed theology. This dignity is acquired in principle by Christ for us, but it's not yet fully experienced and enjoyed. The resolving of this tension comes in glory as well, in the full possession of this dignity. And then there's this tension, this, it's, I call it a cosmic tension, between the wisdom of God and the divine constancy of the divine counsel on the one hand, and the infringement of Satan on the counsel of God on the other hand. So Musculus is talking here about how Satan attempted to overthrow, to throw down in total shame the human race constituted in honor and from blessedness. Satan delivers them to be most miserable. So Satan is constantly at work against the counsel of God. He's trying to undermine the counsel of God. Trying to, to destroy man and to make him miserable and keep him in that misery. Musculus says this tension is resolved by the constancy of the divine will. The divine will 
is, is operating in the background, it's going, never going to change in spite of the devil's attempts at infringing that will. Because, Musculus says, God truly wills that the infringement of Satan is of none effect. Thus, by Christ, he, that is man, is not only restored from that fall, but he is granted the increase of glory. We'll see that in the canons of Dor as well. Man's restoration from the fall, an increase of glory, happens in spite of Satan's attempts at infringing the divine counsel. It's the divine counsel of predestination that, that anchors and secures the believer in this restoration and the fullness of this dignity in glory. And so this is just some aspects of Musculus's interpretation of Psalm 8. And so we see here a massive commentary, a massive contribution by a tiny mouse. It was rooted in the Catholic, small c, Catholic tradition sought to bring doctrinal clarity to sin and grace, to the incarnation, to God's love for humanity, to make those doctrines personal and vibrant in the lives of, of believers. And so, though musculus means little mouse, he wrote a massive commentary that is just beginning to see the light of day. We do well to continue to retrieve that to study these commentaries, not just the musculus, but from all the men of the Reformation, to see the valuable insights they had into Scripture, and to stand against even some of the currents that are alive and well in the academy today of higher criticism, and of uh, playing down the aspects of doctrine derived from Scripture. So we see, we see here how important uh, Scripture was in the Reformation not just in the transformation of their personal lives, but in the transformation of the church and of its doctrines. And so we study the Reformation. We study the commentaries of the Reformation. We study the Bible that was given to us again, in a sense, from the Reformation. And we say with the psalmist, in thy light we shall see light. May God bless his word to us. I don't know if there's any questions or if you just want me to close in prayer and then take questions.